today is um, I want to sort of explain why sort of having an evolutionary perspective is really important when we think about climate change impacts in the sea. I want to tell you about some of the tools and techniques that we can use to actually assess evolutionary uh, potential and just describe and show you some of the progress that's been made to date. I think really this talk's probably most useful, um, particularly for a lot of the students, um, you know, young postdocs and whatever. People that have sort of got an interest, know this is probably important, but haven't really sort of progressed to thinking about, well, how are we going to do some of these things? So hopefully uh, there's some ideas in here that's sort of to promote this idea that we need to do this and some of the ways we can move forward and with a few, uh, hopefully, some nice examples. <coughs> Just to start off with, I'd like to thank a bunch of people who've been uh, really sort of instrumental in uh, helping develop some of the ideas that I'll talk about today and also some of the students and postdocs in particular who've been uh, really driving a lot of this work and, well, it's their work I'm going to be mostly presenting today. So they do the hard stuff and I get to stand up and talk about it. Okay, so we know that climate change is uh, affecting a whole range of physical drivers in the ocean. Uh, we're seeing increases in sea surface temperature, increased CO2 level in the ocean, decreasing pH, all these changes in the physical environment. But what we're really interested in, of course, is what are the biological consequences of that? What's going to happen to species, to communities, to, to the ecosystem? And there are a number of ways that we might go about trying to assess that. We might start, for example, by making observations of natural populations. How are they changing in terms of their abundance, their distribution, their phenology? And we might take those changes and say, OK, we might use those to infer what future changes would happen. Or we might use experiments uh, where we uh, introduce animals to some future environmental condition that we're projecting might occur, higher temperatures, lower pH, and we rear them for some period of time and see what changes happen to uh, some measure of performance. And then again, we use that to infer what might happen in the future when those sorts of conditions uh, arrive in the future. However, there are some limitations to this, and in particular, uh, the really obvious one, is that these sorts of experiments or observations don't account for the evolutionary processes, adaptation that might occur in those populations over the time scale that climate change is occurring over some decades. So we really need to have uh, an evolutionary perspective. And in particular, short-term experiments risk overestimating the impact of climate change. They could underestimate them as well, but they potentially could really overestimate them. And just if you think about it this way, if we have 100 um, animals from a population, um, we, let's say we put them into an experiment and we raise the temperature, that's our treatment, and we find that half of them die. We could throw our hands up in the air and say it's all very terrible, um, half of them died already, population's going to go extinct, it's all awful. An evolutionary biologist might look at that and say, actually that's pretty interesting, 50% of them survived and they did just fine. So there could be some genetic variation in that population that will uh, help over the longer term for adaptation to help overcome some of these problems. So it's really just a matter of perspective. And so what we really need to do, I think, is uh, start to move towards projections that incorporate evolutionary potential. And we're looking for models that might incorporate the demographic effects of climate change and uh, the evolutionary capacity. And what we might be looking for is moving from this sort of model with no evolution, where we're seeing uh, just a steady decline in something like population size through time as the demographic effects kick in, to maybe th uh, accepting that, yes, there's going to be demographic effects, but through time, evolution might start to uh, stabilise or even restore population size, the so-called evolutionary rescue. And just to show you that this isn't some sort of totally esoteric um, effect and that you know, these things we see already in animal populations, here's just two examples. Uh, the first one's rats and when they were first poisoned in the US with, with warfarin. And what you can see is you know, those population crash when they were first poisoned, it came back, they poisoned them again, they went down, they bounced, poisoned them again, they came back up. And when you look at these populations now, what you find is that populations that have been re-exposed several times to warfarin have much greater tolerance to that than those that haven't. And so those populations have adapted through time to this repeated uh, exposure to the poison. We see the same sorts of things with uh, myxomatosis here with rabbits. 
uh, that was introduced to control rabbits. The population absolutely plummeted. But then over a decade or so, it came back up, was rising steadily. Rabbit fleas were introduced to actually enhance the spread of myxomatosis. It crashed again. It came back up. Uh, rabbit hemorrhagic disease, another virus was introduced, went back down. And again, same sort of thing, uh, populations that have had repeated exposure to myxomatosis have much more resistance to that than the populations that haven't. So it seems that they have adapted through time and over relatively short time scales here. So that's just sort of an, an illustration that these things can actually happen. Now there are two ways, two main ways that uh, populations could uh, cope with climate change in the future through acclimation or uh, genetic adaptation. Acclimation, and I synonymise that with acclimatisation. Um, if anyone wants to discuss that later, we can, but I think they're the same thing. Um, and this is physiological, behavioural or morphological adjustment without genetic selection. We're talking about plasticity. And genetic adaptation is selection on genetic variation uh, that's inherited from one generation to the next. But at the end of the day, we might expect the same sort of outcome where we get um, a response so that in the future, a population is better able to cope with some sort of uh, change in the environment like an increase in temperature. So acclimation. Uh, this is a rapid phenotypic response to environmental change. Uh, generally, we would expect it might improve performance in a new environment. And critically, it can also give uh, time for adaptation to catch up. So if you get a plastic response in short term, there might be a bit more time for genetic adaptation over the longer run to actually uh, keep up. And when we're thinking about plasticity in relation to climate change effects, we're usually thinking about a particular type of plasticity which has been referred to as phenotypic buffering. So what we're uh, expecting to see or hoping to see is that some sort of observed functional phenotype actually stays stable uh, with a change in the particular driver of interest. But underneath that, there will be plasticity in things like gene expression or morphology or energy allocation that's actually allowing for that phenotype to, to remain where we um, were hoping that it would. And so that's often been referred to as phenotypic buffering. There are three sort of broad types of acclimation in terms of how long animals are exposed to an environmental uh, fluctuation or change. Uh, there's reversible. This usually happens in adults. And these are short-term regulated responses to environmental variation. They're the sorts of things that you see uh, in populations that experience a lot of daily or seasonal variation. They can uh, acclimate to seasonal changes, uh, winter, some big winter or summer changes. For example, their physiology can adjust. And uh, so we, that's quite commonly known. It's the sort of thing that most people think about when they think about acclimation. We can also get developmental acclimation. And this is where there are irreversible responses uh, to environmental conditions that are experienced during early life history, so early ontogeny. So if you experience a particular uh, environmental condition very early in life, that can set in train a whole range of physiological um, processes that influence how you re respond to that environment later in life and so improve your performance in that condition later in life. And that's called developmental acclimation and that's quite reasonably well known as well. The one that's probably a little bit less well known but is um, generating a lot of interest at the moment is transgenerational acclimation. And this is where the environment experienced by the parents, or even earlier generations, grandparents or great-grandparents, influences the offspring's response to environmental conditions. And you can imagine that this one could be particularly relevant to climate change, where subsequent generations are going to experience the same environmental change. And transgenerational acclimation, just to give you a, a nice example of this, this is one of, I think, one of the sort of early ones that I really liked. This was for uh, Daphnia and water fleas. And these water fleas have two morphologies. So <coughs> this is a normal one, and then they have this pointy helmet, and this uh, helps protect them from predation. And if the parents, if a, a brooding pair of, of uh, Daphnia experience uh, chemical cues from a predator when they're breeding, they produce offspring with uh, more helmeted, many more helmeted types. And it's, even if it's only just a once-off exposure, not just the first brood, the second and the third brood have more of these helmeted types, and even the F2 generation from that single exposure in the adults. So there's a trans generational transmission 
of um, this phenotype that is better for an environment that has predators. And there are a whole bunch of ways that animals might be able to transmit this sort of uh, information to their offspring and Im improve the performance of their offspring. Uh, there could be uh, changes in nutrients. For example, if animals have a, uh, a yolk sac, like a lot of fish, you could, there could be a variation of the nutrients that are in the yolk sac. There can be uh, somatic factors that are uh, transmitted from parents to their offspring, hormones and proteins in yolk or milk or all sorts of ways that that can happen. Uh, but particularly interesting is the epigenetic state of the parents. And these are things like DNA methylation and chromatin structure, and they can act to modify the activity of the genes. They're influenced by the environment, and they're potentially heritable. So there are ways that the actual function of the genes, the expression of the genes, and, and how that influences the phenotype of the environment can be passed from one generation to the next, that's not sort of you know, usual um, Mendelian genetics. And so this is an area of great interest at the moment and it's an area that we're doing uh, quite a bit of work on and other people are as well. So we've been interested um, in transgenerational acclimation for a while um, and this is uh, some work that uh, Jenny Donaldson really pioneered with the spiny damselfish going back a few years now. And she demonstrated that um, there's really limited capacity for reversible acclimation in this fish. If you expose these fish to one and a half to three, or three degrees higher than the average summer temperatures that they experience now, there are um, declines in growth, reproduction and aerobic performance. Now, it doesn't matter how long you, you hold them for at those elevated temperatures, they don't improve. There's, there's really there's no acclimation within a generation. So we, we've, we've read populations over multiple generations to look for developmental and transgenerational acclimation. And this is the design, the basic design that's used. Uh, we have breeding pairs that are brought in and kept at current day temperatures. Then the F1s are either kept at current day or plus 1.5 or plus uh, 3 on a uh, cycling temperature. Then F2s, again, from the current day coming to current day or, the, or plus 1.5 or plus 3. And these ones are just continued through at their high temperatures. And then they're tested at uh, all of the temperatures. And this is a really powerful design because it allows us to look uh, for the acute effects of, of uh, high temperature, developmental effects, whether they just reared up within a generation from early life, or the transgenerational effects of uh, high temperature exposure. And one of the things we've looked at, this is just one of the traits, um, but uh, it's one that's quite widely used, is factorial aerobic scope. You don't really need to worry about what that is other than it's an indicator of their capacity to, um, to uptake oxygen that might be used for a whole range of, of activities, you know, reproduction, getting away from predators, swimming against currents, whatever. Um, but it's, it's commonly used as an indicator of, of performance. And what you see is that uh, if there's no acclimation, these are just the control lines, <coughs> and they're tested at high temperatures, aerobic scope. Um, which is what we've seen regularly, it's what's reported quite often. If we look at the fish that have grown up under higher temperatures, the parents were under higher temperatures, but they've grown up from birth under higher temperatures, we see pretty much the same thing, although there is a little bit of a signal of developmental acclimation here in the highest temperature group, this is the plus three, at plus three, they do better than the controls at plus three. So it seems that actually if you're at um, three degrees higher and you, you grew up under those conditions, your aerobic scope is better than the ones that only just have an acute uh, stress. But the most dramatic thing is when the parents are also under those high temperatures. We see absolute complete restoration of aerobic scope um, in fish that have been reared up at plus 1.5 or plus 3 if their parents were also at those conditions. So there's very strong transgenerational effects on aerobic scope at high temperatures. Now, um, actually, this is under embargo, so if anyone's tweeting, they probably should stop now. <laughs> uh, this is out next week. This is just a sneak preview of a paper that um, we've got coming out next week that uh, Heather Belew's uh, been driving this. <laughs> and what we've actually done is use molecular tools to explore what particular molecular pathways, cellular pathways, are responsible for this phenotypic change, for the transgenerational acclimation. And we were able to identify 53 key genes by, by looking at expression of all the genes 
were able to look, find 53 key genes that were correlated with these changes in aerobic scope uh, across generations. And they were related to metabolism, so it looks like shifts in energy production and energy uh, utilisation are really important in enabling these fish to cope across generations with a high t uh, temperature. There's uh, changes in immunity and stress genes, so we see the new sort of suite of genes that are mobilised for immunity and stress, and there's those that are involved in tissue development and transcriptional regulation. But basically this is just getting at the machinery that allows this to happen. Um, interestingly, uh, we saw absolutely no response whatsoever of heat shock proteins. And to me this is pretty important because um, heat shock proteins have been sort of widely looked at in a whole bunch of marine organisms. And you know, there, might have, there might be some feeling that uh, they might be useful for indicators of um, long-term thermal responses. At least in these fish, this tells us that you know, um, these sort of short-term heat stress responses are not good indicators of long-term <coughs> thermal acclimation. And so you know, they're not necessarily going to be, able to, be uh, able to be used. It's not just in... Um, Temperature effects that we've seen across generations are also in response to high CO2 levels, ocean acidification. This is some work that uh, Gabby Miller did a few years ago. And what we found was that uh, these, this is standard length and survival of these little baby uh, anemone fish when they're reared up under high CO2. This is the controls, and so this is you know, under control conditions, the, uh, the length and the survival. If we rear them up under high CO2, length and survivorship goes down. So that's how we would normally do the experiments. We get these baby fish, we rear them up under a, a high CO2, we compare them to the controls, and we say, wow, there's no massive effects in this population of high CO2, even if we rear them up from, from birth. However, if their parents were under those high CO2 conditions, again, we saw complete restoration of the phenotypic traits. So a complete um, uh, restoration of the length and survivorship. We also had a, a temperature uh, effect con, um, treatment here as well, but I didn't include that. So transgenerational acclimation uh, to high CO2. But I should also sort of make the point that now this isn't a, a sort of a panacea, it's not a golden bullet. Um, there are instances where we see there are no effects of having parents under those conditions as well. And this is uh, work that, uh, that Meg Welsh just uh, published late last year, looking at the effects of uh, the behavioural effects of high CO2, and in particular, in this case, the response to olfactory uh, cues. And uh, what we've known for a little while is that if fish are exposed to high CO2 for a little while, that they start to do really weird things in terms of their response to chemical cues and things like alarm cues. And uh, this is the time spent in an alarm cue that they normally avoid. This is a control. You can see they, uh, they nicely avoid the control, the, um, the alarm cue. They don't want to go near it. It's a good indicator of the uh, presence of a predator. However, if they've been reared up under high CO2, that's these two, they start to become attracted to the alarm cue, um, and which is probably not a particularly good idea if you want to stay alive. And so given the results of those previous studies where we found that having the parents under either high temperature or high CO2 basically completely reversed the effect, um, Meg was interested in whether there would be uh, the same sort of things with uh, behavioural effects of CO2, high CO2, at least on the olfactory cues, and uh, no, there wasn't. Absolutely no effect, basically, of having parents under high CO2. So uh, I think it's just a good demonstration that while you know, some traits, are, are, there's really strong transgenerational effects, others there are not. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be affected exactly the same, um, or occur exactly the same way. So just to summarise this sort of part of the talk, um, it's pretty clear to me, at least, that transgenerational acclimation is potentially a really powerful mechanism by which uh, populations can adjust to rapid climate change. And it's something we really need to think about when we're doing climate change experiments. Uh, from work that we've been doing uh, over the last little while, it's also clear that it may take several generations for full acclimation potential to be expressed. So the generation, the parental generation, might actually need to grow up under those conditions. So they might need to instigate developmental acclimation that is then brought into the adults, which are then is transmitted to the next generation. Not won't always be just a short-term sort of exposure in the adults, but not all traits uh, acclimate across generations. <laughs>
Uh, and there's a whole bunch of you know, areas that are now sort of, I think, ripe for exploration. Uh, this is looking at things like whether short-term acclimation will translate to long-term persistence. And we're still doing relatively short-term experiments. What are the costs and the trade-offs? None of these things are likely to be free. There's not too many free lunches in this world. And so and I think this is one of them, where there will be some um, costs and trade-offs. And the really big one is how does this interact with genetic adaptation? Um, it could slow it down. Uh, if you get rapid shifts in the phenotype without selection, uh, they could actually slow down genetic adaptation. It might accelerate it. There's some ideas that it can drag genes along um, that are then sort of fixed in the population through a process called genetic assimilation. So that's an area that we really don't know much about at all, is this interface between acclimational plasticity and, uh, and genetic adaptation, which is what I'll move into now. And so this is an area that's really also garnering a lot of uh, attention. And just in the last couple of years, as you'll see by the, the dates on the publications that I'm hopefully going to show you in this section, uh, <coughs> most of what's happened in this field has probably happened in the last two or three years, uh, or maybe even in the last year. And we're, what we're interested in, of course, is uh, selection on genetic variation that's inherited from one generation to the next. And there are a bunch of ways we could potentially go about assessing evolution potential. There's field studies, experimental evolution, quantitative genetics, molecular approaches, or a combined approach, which I think could be the most powerful of all. And I'll show you some examples of all of these and some of the limitations. If you really want to get into the details of this, I'm, this is just going to be sort of a, a broad brush of what the, these techniques are about and some examples, but if you want to look at it in more detail, there's been three or four papers published in the last couple of years, um, some of which I've been involved, some of which I haven't, that um, you might want to have a look at, and there's more than that. They're just some, a, a few uh, ones that describe some of these techniques. Okay, so field populations, field studies. We could actually go out and we could make comparisons among populations, and that might tell us something about adaptation or the potential for adaptation. We could look across environmental gradients, or we could say look at analogue environments that are you know, representative of what, the, what we think the future is going to look like, and we could see how the animals are doing in those environments. And this is just an example uh, for salmon. This is uh, in Canada, where they've got uh, salmon that run up different rivers, and those different rivers have different thermal uh, ranges and histories. And what uh, you see in that is that the thermal reaction norm for aerobic scope, the same one that we've been looking at, the thermal reaction norm for aerobic scope varies among rivers in relation to the temperature profile for those rivers. And so that's pretty good evidence probably for genetic adaptation. But there are some limits to this sort of uh, design. One is that, in fact, it's really difficult to distinguish plasticity from adaptation, from uh, local adaptation. You know there's a difference, but you don't really know whether it is local adaptation or whether there's a large phenotypic uh, response, um, plasticity. <laughs> response. The other thing that's a real problem for us is you don't know what time frame this sort of um, ad adaptive response has occurred over. Now, can it occur over the sorts of time frames that we're interested in with climate change? So it's a useful first step, but there are some, some real limitations. The other thing that's been increasingly used, I think, is sort of analogue environments. Um, people go out um, to places that sort of a representative of the future. And these can be really exciting places. I've worked in them myself. I think they're, they're great natural laboratories. But there can be some problems that we need to be at least cognizant of. Uh, for example, if we went to upwelling zones or natural CO2 seeps that might have high CO2 levels, sort of uh, similar to what we're predicting is going to occur in the future. If we looked at an upwelling zone, all well and good, but you know, usually nutrients are high and temperatures are low. So you've got some real confounding factors if you're looking at CO2 effects. Um, if you go to CO2 seeps, uh, these are great places for looking at sort of communities in there that are all interacting together, but they have some other problems, particularly because they're generally very small in spatial extent. And what that means is that they're continually receiving external lava supply from outside of the seeps. And so most of the recruitment that's in those seeps is probably coming from populations that are currently not under a high CO2 environment. And so they probably have a massive genetic migration load 
that's um, really going to impair adaptation in those locations. And so we need to be a little careful, at least, of how we infer uh, any adaptive potential as a result of these locations. Um, another way that uh, is increasingly being used is a process called um, experimental evolution. This is a, a pretty cool um, and really uh, fairly intuitive approach where you just basically rear animals for many generations under selection. And you look at realised evolution. So you don't really care how it happens, what the process is, other than you know, do they adapt or not. And just to give you an idea of sort of how this runs, you, know, you have a population, you split them up into replicates, then you run them through time either in control or um, under, let's say, high CO2 or high temperature, a selection environment, lots of generations, and then you test them under all of the combinations and you look to see whether there's any evidence that they've adapted. And, of course, you can imagine this is uh, best suited to sort of small, short-lived animals um, or organisms that can be you know, cultured over many generations really quickly algae and plankton and things, and that's where it's been widely used and it's, it's most powerful. Um, there's a lot of studies starting to come through that have used experimental evolution, demonstrating that in some cases uh, there you know, is clear evidence for adaptation over a relatively short period of time. And so here's just one, it's a coccolithophore, uh, and it was reared up under either control uh, or high CO2, and this is uh, control CO2, high CO2, and then it's tested under control or high, control or high, and what you can see, um, organic carbon, organic uh, nitrogen, the, the controls under the normal conditions under high CO2 is a massive spike, but if they've been reared up for, for many generations under those conditions, uh, that doesn't occur. So these populations have adapted. And so that's just sort of a really classic example. Um, this is you know, cherry-picked from their... Um, from this particular paper, there are other cases where other uh, traits that didn't adapt. So that's just to demonstrate the technique and that it can be quite powerful for some of these um, small uh, organisms that have really rapid generation times and can be reared in, in culture pretty well. One of the really, I think one of the, you know, the strongest techniques and the most promising is quantitative genetics. And this is a field that's been around for a long time, it's been a mainstay of evolutionary biology, but really, you know, particularly uh, as climate scientists or you know, particularly ecologists, we haven't picked it up as, uh, as well as it really deserves to be. And, you know, but there's a few people that are really doing that now. And there are a whole bunch of techniques within quantitative genetics, um, and they can be useful for different uh, approaches. We can do things like uh, parent offspring correlations to look for heritable, heritability. Uh, we can <coughs> map through pedigrees or this really powerful design of breeding designs. And this is the, the thing I think that's got most scope uh, for doing some really exciting things. And this is where we, you know, we cross a whole bunch of, of uh, males and females. We cross, completely cross fertilise them. We rear the offspring out. And then we use um, some statistical techniques to partition out the, the phenotypic variation into that that's due to the fathers, the mothers, interaction between the mothers and the fathers, and the environment. And in particular, if we think that the fathers are mostly just conti contributing their genes in the sperm, that's sort of the assumption. Not necessarily <coughs> completely right, as we know more about epigenetics, but uh, that's the general assumption. Then uh, the contribution from the fathers is uh, what we uh, call the additive genetic variation. That's what we think of as the, uh, the genetic variation that is heritable. Um, and we can do things like we can look at gene-by-environment interactions and see... You know, which fathers might be you know, not able to do very good in a do very well in a other new environment, and which ones actually might um, perform just fine. These might be the ones that are, are going to provide the genes to do well in a high CO2 environment. And this is this sort of technique is particularly useful for broadcast forms. So if you've got something like sea urchins, corals, uh, things like that, where you can actually get the eggs and the sperm and you can uh, mix them around, then this is potentially a really powerful technique. And I'll, I'll show you a couple of uh, examples of that, at least uh, towards the end. Uh, here's one uh, for fish, and I thought I'd, I'd throw in a fish example just because it was fish, and I, uh, that's what I wanted to promote. And this was, a, um, this was a really nice study that was done in Canada, uh, just published this year, with salmon. And salmon are great because they are broadcast spawners and you can collect the eggs, you can collect the sperm, 
they've, you know, they've got decades of, of work on how to rear these things and how to breed them and rear them. So they had wild salmon, they went out and they collected the sperm and the eggs, they crossed lots of males with lots of females, and then they looked at um, the phenotypic traits, in this case, related to heart function. And um, previously I told you about uh, how aerobic scope is one of the really important things that we're measuring. And it looks like the cardiac function, the heart function, is one of the really critical things that underlies um, aerobic scope and um, how it changes under high temperatures. And so they looked at uh, whether there was either plasticity or heritable genetic variation in a whole bunch of traits of the heart under high temperatures. Um, and they found that, yes, there was plasticity and heritable genetic variation in a couple of the really key traits in relation to heart function. And so that's really promising. It suggests that these traits could adapt through time to higher temperatures. But then they found one other really critical piece of information. I think this is sort of you know, one of these things where it just gives you that warning that, you know, yes, all this is great, but there's, you know, often there's, um, there's some limitations. And this is that there's this one temperature, uh, one trait of the heart. This is the rhythmic um, temperature of the heart, and that's where the heart starts to beat irregularly. The animal's basically having a heart attack. And so uh, after the, the peak or optimal temperature is reached, just a bit after that, you get the arrhythmic temperature. And there was absolutely no plasticity or heritable genetic variation in the arrhythmic te temperature of the heart. So it seems like that has come up against a hard boundary already, through um, probably through selection already, and there's no more scope for that. So if these populations, they might have some scope for adaptation through this temperature range, but if they were ultimately to get here, they could uh, at then suffer quite catastrophic losses. That's without thinking about behavioural effects and all sorts of other things, whether they shifted the you know, timing of spawning and things like that. But I thought that was quite a nice example of the sort of techniques that could be used. But not all, that, not all fish are actually that easy to, to breed, uh, and we're stuck with some in the tropical waters that are not quite as, uh, as easy as salmon. Uh, and the spiny damsel fish is a pretty easy one as, uh, as tropical fish go, but we still can't cross-fertilise lots of males and females. And so we've been using a different approach. We've been using a, a pedigree mapping approach. And so what we can do with our experiments, where we've reared them through for multiple generations, is we can look at the offspring, and then we can track them back through their parents and their grandparents, even their great-grandparents. And then we can use a, a particular statistical technique called the animal model, it's just a, a statistical model, um, to actually look at the heritability of any traits we're interested in. And now this is uh, unpublished data at the moment, but now we've been able to show there's very, very strong uh, heritability in things like uh, factorial aerobic scope. So we would expect that that could adapt relatively quickly under a selection gradient uh, in the future. And we can also look at you know, gene-by-environment interactions and see that you know, there are some families that lots of them you know, don't do well under high temperatures, but there are a few that are able to maintain their performance and some that even actually do better. And, of course, they're going to be the ones that we're going to expect the, the, uh, where the genes are going to be coming from. OK, so that's quantitative genetics in a nutshell. I mean, that's a, a 10 minutes of a very, very complicated uh, topic, but I just wanted to give people a flavour for the sorts of things that could be, can be done. The other one that's really garnering an awful lot of attention now, and I think mostly, for a large degree, just because the you know, techniques are becoming easier and, and more accessible, is molecular approaches. And there are a whole bunch of things we can do with this and some things we really can't. That's what I wanted to get across here today with this. Um, you can do things like you can survey genetic variation. You can go out and survey populations, look at how much genetic variation there is. You could identify genetic selection if you had a selection gradient. Uh, they're really, really great for looking at insights and mechanisms. As, as I showed you with the uh, transcriptome for the fish, we can look at which genes were responsible for the phenotypic response. But alone, molecular techniques by themselves pretty much do not predict evolution potential. So I guess that's a real take-home message I want to get from today, um, that I think some people are a little, maybe a little blinded to what they can find by themselves. Um, and the reason for that is generally the genotype to phenotype map in just about anything is weak. 
even in humans, where we've been uh, mapping the whole genome, we've been uh, throwing billions of dollars at it, uh, the genotype to phenotype map is still pretty weak. Um, so let alone for animals that we don't even have, haven't even sequenced, haven't got the genome for. So that's just a, a word of warning there. Um, <coughs> But where I think they're really useful and where they really come into their own, and this is where they're being increasingly used, um, and by you know, people in, in this room as well, as I'll show you um, in a minute, is um, when they're combined with field studies and experiments. And that's where you can have a really super powerful approach. Um, here's just an example of a field study that's, uh, that used molecular approaches. It was sort of a nice, um, simple illustration. This was uh, uh, sea urchins, the west coast of the US, and there's a, a change in the frequency of exposure to low pH water. Um, it's not completely in line sort of uh, geographically. This is the, the order of exposure. These are the, where they were sampled. Anyway, they sequenced a whole bunch of genes, and what they could find was that there was you no, know, these three um, uh, processes were, were involved with uh, being able to cope with the lower pH in these, these populations. So it was just a nice way of going out in the field, saying, well, we, we know these, these particular populations um, have low pH regularly, they seem to do all right. What is it that allows them possibly to do that? And it's probably got to do with some of these processes here. Here's another example of where sort of you know, molecular and um, sort of field experiments were combined into a, a pretty cool uh, experiment. <coughs> this is work that Steve Palumbi did with some, some lit, just little tide pools uh, where there was a, some uh, cool, moderate variation pools and there were also some pools that got really hot. And they transplanted corals, coral fragments, um, across those two pools. They did a reciprocal transplant. And there are a couple of things to, to get out of this. The first is that if you just look at... Um, this, is the, this is basically the thermal tolerance or thermal sensitivity of corals in the, uh, the cool pool, and this is those in the warm pool. And so you can see that those in the warm pool actually uh, have uh, a more tolerant of warm conditions. So that's the first thing. Then when they did the transplant, they moved uh, those from the, the warm to the cool. They had less tolerance then. Those from the cool to the warm got more tolerant and so or more resistant. And so that's pretty good evidence for acclimation. They were acclimatised. Um, through time to, those, to the new condition that they were, were put into. The next thing they did was then they sequenced a whole bunch of genes and they looked at how that related to thermal tolerance and they found that there were 74 genes that were related to where the corals were transplanted into and 71 genes, though, these are from, these are from genetically identical coral fragments, I should point out, um, that there were 74 uh, genes that were differentially expressed that were related to where they were transplanted to, and 71 that were differentially expressed were actually related to the pool that they came from, whether it was hot or cold. And so they concluded from that that uh, basically there's about 50-50 fixed effects and acclimation. I'll just point out they were very careful with their wording. They didn't say 50-50 um, genetic or local adaptation and acclimation effects. Uh, the reason for that is that they couldn't really be certain that those fixed effects of the pool, whether they were really as a result of genetic adaptation, whether there might have been epigenetic effects or developmental effects in there. But it was nevertheless, you know, I think, a really cool start to demonstrating that there you know, are some, uh, some effects that can happen over a relatively short time scale uh, for thermal tolerance, even in corals. And this is another really nice one that's just come out. Um, and uh, Lena was involved in this one, a really nice study where they basically they took corals from uh, a northern Great Barrier Reef from Princess Charlotte Bay and Orpheus Island, so further south, and they did a quantitative genetic design. Now, I think even you know, Lena had agreed they probably would have liked to have had more than two, um, two parents on each case, but it still proved uh, really, really useful. They d did the crosses, and then they looked at the survival of the, the baby corals and how thermally tolerant they were. And what they found was that uh, if the corals actually came from parents that were at Princess Charlotte Bay, if the parents were up, up from there, they were a lot more heat tolerant to high, tolerant to high temperatures than if the parents actually came from uh, Orpheus. And so 
Uh, first of all, there's clear evidence. Uh, this is pretty good evidence, really, probably of local adaptation here. Then they were able to sort of um, uh, partition out the, these phenotypic responses. And this is probably the, um, one of the disadvantages of having a relatively small breeding design is that they've got lots and lots of... Um, the, the errors are pretty big here. It makes it hard to get a significance in a statistical test in particular. But uh, I think you know, the, the basics of the trends here are really strong. But uh, the, there's a no most of the variation in the um, phenotypic responses is explained by where your parents came from, the combined effects. There's about something like about 11%, I think it was, that was um, sire, maybe about 60% that was from uh, the females, uh, and there was an interaction. But the point is they were able to demonstrate that there were likely heritable uh, uh, effects uh, of thermal tolerance as a result of whether you came from Princess Charlotte or Orpheus. And the effects on survivorship are massive. Now, we're talking about you know, um, tenfold differences in the ability to survive. And I hope I've done that reasonable justice, Lena. But um, go, and, go and have a look at it anyway. It's a really nice paper. The next thing they were able to do uh, is then use some molecular techniques and uh, do a couple of things. They were able to add supporting evidence to the fact that this is probably um, additive genetic variation. It's, it's, um, it's heritable. Uh, and also that they were able to look at which particular um, genes seem to be changing uh, in these cases, and you know, they linked it back to things like oxidative processes, transport and mitochondrial function. So again, using these molecular techniques to actually understand the processes that are allowing these corals to adapt to the warmer conditions. Um, I think that puts a little bit of a dent in some of the arguments that people might occasionally have that uh, corals po couldn't possibly um, adapt to a warmer environment. So just, uh, I think... in general summary of this section. I've only got a tiny bit left after this. Um, I think there's, you know, hopefully I've shown that there's increasing evidence for evolutionary potential. There's a whole range of techniques and approaches that are available. And, you know, if you're interested, go and find someone that knows how to do it and, uh, and talk to them. I think experimental approaches really need to examine both uh, heritability and uh, oh, sorry, we need to, sorry, we need to use experimental approaches. I think these are going to be the most powerful are experimental approaches that are then potentially linked with molecular approaches. We need to test for both acclimation and adaptation because uh, they're both almost certainly going to happen. Nearly every study that's you know, looked at them so far is seeing both plastic and, um, and genetic variation. They can be difficult to disentangle. You've got to think about it carefully. And... At least from my perspective, I think acclimation is going to be really important in a climate change perspective, um, at least in terms of buffering populations against climate change because it can happen quickly. It can happen within the lifetime of even animals that have very long generations. <coughs> even things that are living 30 or 40 years, uh, there's potential for parental effects um, to, to help them uh, just in a couple of generations. There are some things that we really don't have much of a handle on at all at the moment. Um, so I've shown you a, a little bit of evidence that um, there can be a heritable genetic variation, but usually when we're looking at this so far, we usually focus just on one trait. And uh, we're early on in this, this field, and often we're just looking at, for example, ocean acidification or temperature. But, of course, those things are going to be co-varying together. Those drivers are going to be changing together, and we need to understand how the genetic variation in the animals is structured. Are there negative correlations in genetic variation between, for example, you know, sensitivity to pH and temperature. If there was, um, then they might actually constrain the scope for adaptation if there was a neg negative correlation. But if they were positively correlated, then you know, selection on one could drag the other lot along effectively. And so you could actually get um, a really advanced uh, and accelerated adaptation. So understanding how adaptation of multiple stress is, is going to be a real key as we move forward. And uh, I think the other thing is um, once we you know, start to get a handle on some of these figures, we're going to have to start to try and parameterise demographic models, these sort of evolutionary rescue models. So where I started with that really simple simple sort of perspective of, no, are we just sort of going to hell in a handbasket or could you know, adaptation, evolution start to help over long enough time scales? Once we can get some parameters, a bit of a handle on this, then we can start putting those factors into models. It's already been done uh, for some groups of animals. There was a really nice um, 
seen issue of the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society about two years ago now that dealt with this um, and uh, just shows that there's a whole sort of field of modelling that's being developed that can basically start to, to be used once we can um, some, add some numbers in. And obviously, eventually, we're going to, get to need to get to community level models, but don't ask me how we're going to do that because I don't have a clue. Um, and that looks like it's the end. I'll leave it there. <laughs>